Morning, everyone. As part of SSR Bytes Lecture, today we'll be talking about metal artifact reduction MRI for the beginners. I'm Avni Shabra from Dallas, Texas. These are my disclosures with no conflict of interest. Our learning objectives will be to explain basic physics concepts of MRI relevant to metal imaging, discuss metal artifact reduction MRI techniques, and illustrate the role of available softwares for metal artifact MRI. MRI, as you know, is based on electromagnetic energy and once you put the body in the magnet, there's a net magnetization vector, which is along the direction of the applied magnetic field, B0. That's called the longitudinal magnetization. Then the protons are flipped by an alpha angle using a B1 pulse, and they relax. They relax with spin lattice relaxation, also referred to as T1, and spin-spin relaxation, which is referred to as T2. This is how the curves look like. Basically, there is a gain back of the longitudinal magnetization when it gets to two thirds of the original value. That's called the T1 time of a tissue. And there's a fall of the transverse magnetization, which falls to two third, falls by two third, meaning falls to one third of the original value. That's the T2 time of a tissue. There is a GRE type sequence, which has less than 90 degree flip. And what you get is a free induction decay, very fast imaging, but not so good looking images versus a spin echo type image where there's 90 degree flip followed by 180 degree refocusing pulses. And that gives you a spin echo type image. And uh, that is a better looking image. So here you can see this is a spin echo image, which, which is better looking and has this tenosynovial giant cell tumor versus you have a GRE type image, um, which is a worse looking image, but has this lot of artifacts, susceptibility artifacts from PBNS. Now these spin echo images come in three flavors. They can be T1 weighted where the fluid is dark, can be T2 weighted where the fluid is bright, or can be proton density in between where the fluid is gray. And this grayish image is actually the best SNR image, it looks pretty good. Now, when the signals come back, they have to be encoded. Where are they coming from that space by slice, phase, and frequency encoding. So once the RF pulse is complete, that B1 pulse, the slice selecting gradient is turned off because we have selected the slice and the phase is turned out to provide that different phase shift to that proton we are trying to encode. And then when that's turned off, the readout gradient is turned on to record the signal. That's the frequency selective gradient or the readout gradient. And this is repeated multiple times till the image is created. So if you have a matrix of 256, you're repeating 256 times. And this phase encoding gradient takes the most time. So if you have a 3D image, you have two phase encoding gradients. Finally, the time between the repetitions of the sequence is called the TR time. And the time between the echoes is called the echo time. Now, the third type of imaging is inversion recovery, where you start with 180 and then 90 and then 180. So the time between 180 and 90, called the tau time, basically determines what you suppress. So it's based on the timing, not the frequencies. So if the time is short, you suppress the fat. The time is long, you suppress the fluid. That's called the flare sequence. This is called the stir sequence. So here is a stir sequence. Um, in this case, on the left side, you can see there's a lot of poor fat suppression. So you're not sure this bone marrow is normal or abnormal. So that's a frequency selective fat suppression, where you have better signal in the image, but poor fat suppression. And here in this large field of view, you have poorer signal but better fat suppression. And you can see there's a little bit of bone marrow edema there. So, and also soft tissue edema. So that's a stir image showing you the um, better suppression of the fat. Now, what do the metals result in? They result in signal voids due to dephasing and failure of excitation. And some metals are very notorious like steel, cobalt, chromium, or revision orthoplasties. So it leads to signal pile up artifact, this white stuff, due to geometric distortions. And usually 10 kilohertz distortion leads to 10 pixel displacement. So the protons are displaced. Um, and also there's variation of field strength which leads to failure of the frequency selective fat suppression. So ultimately you have through plane artifacts like this and in plane artifacts, you get signal voids, etc. So these are more pronounced on the higher field strength because there's more SNR. Also, there are more artifacts on the three Tesla as compared to 1.5 Tesla. That's why we limit our imaging to 1.5 Tesla. So here you can see there's a lot of artifact here that's on a three Tesla 3D image, which was done. So to minimize metal artifacts, do not use gradient echo sequence. It's fast, but it's not good. So here you can see there's a metal processes here with a lot of artifact. 
do not use a spectral fact suppression because you'll get a lot of artifacts like that. And then you can uh, hide these areas of particle disease, which are better seen on that inversion recovery sequence, but because this is based on timing and this is based on frequencies and frequencies are disturbed, timing is not disturbed. So you can use the inversion recovery sequence here. So these are the things which are done on any of the magnets, use lower magnetic strength, lower gradient strength, orient the frequency encoding along the metal because that's where the artifacts you want along the metal, but you want to see across the metal with no artifacts. So keep the longest length of the metal parallel to that B0. Increase the signal strength. So it's all a game of SNR. So use a lower echo time. You saw that T2 transverse magnetization it falls over time. So if you keep the echo time lower, you get more signal more nexus or more acquisitions. So instead of one acquisition, you could do one and a half or two acquisitions. Decrease the echo spacing, meaning we have more 180 degree pulses, more echoes. So that will reduce the echo spacing, less noise, more signal, or it's also called pixel shift in some scanners. Also increase the receiver bandwidth. That's basically the ear of the magnet. If you have higher bandwidth, that means you're listening to more of the signal and increase the strength of the readout gradient and improve the spatial resolution to limit noise to smaller pixels. So use large matrix size or thinner slices. Now, some metals are notorious, as I said, they create a lot of these artifacts. So to minimize, first of all, you're using the stir sequence so you can reduce all these artifacts. Secondly, you can also evaluate these tendons because you want to look at the soft tissues versus you could not see on the other image because of all these artifacts. Now there are automated software modification rather than the manual things we discussed. So there's view angle tilt, which basically uh, mitigates the geometric distortion, the off-plane distortions which are happening. So the second one is CMAC. CMAC is basically, it adds the phase encoding steps, those which take a little more time. So it reduces some distortions. Then warp is a combination of all this. You add the view angle tilt, you add the CMAC, plus you increase the bandwidth by another 100 to 150 kilohertz, and that'll lead to better imaging. There's a Maverick variant, which I think is a GE variant, where it's a 3D fast spin echo images, and you use small off resonance frequency pulses, and you reduce those pixel shift from 10 kilohertz to about two kilohertz. And again, these are done at 1.5 Tesla, and there are some other newer variants, which are hybrids. So, <clears throat> what can we see? Well, here's a knee with the metal. This is the artifact. This is with the frequency selector. You can see the fat is suppressed, but not the metal area it looks so bad. Now you can do a stir image, which shows the area better, but again, you don't see much around the metal because of these artifacts. Now, if you do a uh, warp sequence or a CMAC, then you can see around the metal also, but it's a blurry image. So the Whenever you gain something or lose something, so there's a time penalty, meaning you're spending more time. Second, you may increase the blur. So you may have to optimize these sequences for your practice. So here's an optimized CMAC. You can see a hip arthroplasty. You can evaluate the areas around the arthroplasty. This will increase signal is normal on the fat suppressed sequence. And you can see, you can evaluate all these structures, whether it's bone or soft tissue around the metal. Where does it help? Well, you got a lesion here, which was a chondrosarcoma of the femur. They removed it from this young patient. And now the patient is under surveillance. So we need to see all of this bone to see if there's any recurrence in that area. The local recurrences are common. So you need this kind of optimized imaging. One of our PhDs, Jerry Wang, he actually used a permanent magnet, which you can place outside the face. And if you have dental braces, et cetera, it attracts all that magnetism. So you can get your bad diffusion as good diffusion looking sequence. So multiple other modifications are coming, but basically these are all novel thoughts. So what are the adverse events we can see? Well, these are all of them. So let's look at some of the examples. So you can see synovial expansion. That's a normal phenomenon where the capsule because it's broken by the prosthesis, it expands into the bursa and you may see a little bit of fluid there which may be asymptomatic. Versus this kind of case where when you suppress the metal artifact, you can see these focal areas of increased signal. These are particle disease or adverse local tissue reaction. These can be huge. Like in this case, there's a big area you can see on CT, also on MR, you can see all of this, a lot of synovial thickening and also in the bone. These are hypersensitivity reactions. So the previous one, particle disease of macrophage predominant reaction, this is lymphocyte predominant. These are called L-wall. 
Here's another case, you have bilateral arthroplasties on CT, you don't see much. On MRI, you see all of this L wall again, a lot of particle is everywhere. Now, one can also find abduct deficiencies as a cause of symptoms. So here's metal on metal prosthesis, a lot of artifact on the frequency selective images. When you do the warp sequence, you can see the areas around the metal. These look okay, no particle disease, but the abductors are missing. The gluteus minimus is missing and part of the medius is missing. So these are abducted tears and you can see atrophy of the muscles too. For the infection cases, uh, uh, clinical parameters are looked at and one may do a technetium 99M or indium 111 scanning and you may see increased uptake around the knee suggesting infection. But with MRI, it's much easier. You may see all of this increased signal in the fascial planes, pericapsular planes, food collections, debris, and layered appearance. So this is all infection. And lastly, you may see neurovascular injuries. So here you can see a thinned out sciatic nerve, which was completely descent on surgery and a cable grafting was performed. So to summarize, we can evaluate a lot with metal artifact reduction. These are suggested readings. And finally, don't forget to check out the SSR Resident Education Club for more interactive lectures and bites on the SSR YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us today. Have a nice day.